eat. Well, we're just going to do questions, then we're going to eat. There's a question here which sort of links a couple of things together that um, any tests of the brain done when instructed to be consciousness, to be conscious, sorry, uh, and that there's a whole um, area of research at the moment being done called affective neuroscience. One of the people who does this is a chap called Richard Davidson at the University of Wisconsin, and he's been working with a lot of the monks that the Dalai Lama associates with, and there's been a lot of experimentation done um, in, in various meditative states to see exactly what's going on. And it seems to me that there's an interesting correlation here between some of the stuff that Sue was saying earlier, um, in that um, we're beginning to find out more of a connection between what you'd have to call Eastern and Western ways of investigation. Uh, I suspect that um, the fact that the Dalai Lama is going to be a speaker at the Society for Neuroscience Conference this uh, November is not incidental. And I think, uh, as my wife says, that if the Buddha were alive today, he'd probably be a neuroscientist. Um, <laughs> So let's uh, move on and see if, let, let's take this an, a really ultimate question here. Um, can physical determinism and conscious, free, can, free, can physical determinism and free will coexist? To what degree was the flipping of my hand that Susan had us doing started by the Big Bang? Uh, no and completely. Your questions. <laughs> no and completely. Sorry? No, and completely. No, and completely. OK. <laughs> Any of the other panelists want to talk about that one? Oh, that'll do. OK, well, that. <laughs> Sorry, no. Other, it's other a people. tough audience that dis <laughs> dispatched that one very quickly. Um, let me put a couple together here. Can you explain the um, advent of consciousness in terms of natural selection and evolutionary survival advantages. Dr. Sanowski, what implications does your research on neural economics have for the issue of free will versus determinism again? Um, or what if I threw out a, a, a statement like, um, consciousness is the state uh, uh, w that we enter in response to salient information. Uh, we're, when we're talking about driving a car and we're, we're not spending any time attending to what is going on, we get to from point A to point B. We have no idea how we did it because it's just information that we've used before, very simple. It's not salient anymore. Of course, it becomes salient if, if, if somebody runs in front of your car. Then suddenly the journey becomes a memorable one. So uh, this is a question about attention. Uh, one of the things that uh, psychologists have really studied very carefully is the ability to which you can filter out irrelevant information from the environment and focus on and respond to a, a specific piece of information that may be very uh, relevant. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be the most salient. It doesn't have to be the one that's the brightest. It could be something fairly subtle. For example, a red light. And you're in this beautiful paradise and the red light comes on. Uh, well, depending on the context, you might want to stop your car or on the other hand, if you're uh, it, uh, in a movie theater and the red light comes on, you might want to worry about fire. So how you respond to a subtle piece of information really, uh, has, you have to include uh, what your, uh, how you interpret that piece of information. Now, <clears throat> going to the earlier uh, part of that question having to do with determinism, the more we learn by recording from large populations of neurons in the brain is that there's a <clears throat> probabilistic element. If you repeat the same stimulus twice, you never get the same response twice. And that's because there's internal state variables. And as I said, how you interpret a piece of information may depend on uh, your expectations and what it is you're looking for when that sensory stimulus occurs. So I think that um, there's, there's plenty of room for uh, variability, both from the perspective of uh, fluctuations within the physical content of the brain, but also the, 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 the how, how it is that um, the probabilities, uh, for example, are changing over time. How, how you interpret a stimulus will depend on how hungry you are, for example. You know, how I look at a piece of food, an apple, might look very different um, in my brain when I'm hungry compared to if I'm not. And so uh, I think that there's, there's there's, there's a lot of probabilistic uh, computing going on there, and most of it's not 
un unfortunately, um, uh, available to introspection. We just don't know how we come up with these uh, decisions. Do anybody want to try and, uh, and add to that? Uh, uh, do you see any functional adaptive um, reason for having something that we call consciousness? I'd like to say something about that. I bet you would. Um, <laughs> sounds <laughs> ominous. Um, <clears throat> It's, it's a very natural idea to think that it, since we are conscious, it must have evolved, and if it evolved, it must have a function. But that's not necessarily so. Um, and you can get in big muddles thinking about that. Um, if, for example, if you are uh, an identity theorist or even a functionalist, you're going to say consciousness itself didn't evolve. What evolved was all the capacities that's led us to be this kind of creature. So all you know, perception, learning, memory, all of these things evolved for reasons. But consciousness if you're an identity theorist, just is those things, or if you're a functionalist, it necessarily comes about with those things. Uh, many people working on consciousness would say that, but a whole lot of other people would say, oh, it must have a function of its own, and they start looking for that function. And then, then you get into, into a muddle. Another muddle people get into is thinking about zombies, the philosopher zombie, the idea that there could be a creature that looks like me, behaves like me, says all the things I do, but it's all dark inside. In other words, that no consciousness, know what it's like to be. Then, if you believe in the possibility of zombies, you're going to say, well, why didn't we evolve as zombies? Why did we evolve with consciousness? Well, then you're imagining consciousness as this kind of extra something that's added on. But if a zombie is possible, that doesn't, can't have any function, because if it did, you wouldn't be identical. And so these things, you just go round and round. Personally, I think, sorry, personally, I think it's much, much best to stick with the first one, either the functionalist or the identity theorist, and say, somehow or another, if we evolve the way we do by natural selection for visible traits such as behavior, you know, behaviors and, and, and perceptions and learning and so on, then what we need to understand is why a creature that evolved that way is conscious. If you're me, you'll say, well, it isn't really conscious. There's no such thing as conscious. There's just an illusion of, being, of having a stream of consciousness. If you're some other people, you'll say, well, it, it naturally emerges. Um, those, I think, are the realm of possible answers to the question. But it's a nightmare. When I wrote the consciousness textbook, the one on evolution was just the hardest, <laughs> to my surprise. I thought I understood something about evolution. Much the hardest. It gets you into big, big tangles. There's a question for John Allman. Do you know of evidence for or against a spatial map of emotional space in the brain where, where might one best look for such a map if it exists? The anterior cingulate cortex, amygdala, FI? Well, there's some evidence for it. Um, the um, sort of complex social emotions uh, seem to be preferentially involved in anterior insula and frontal insular cortex. Or the more, uh, the simpler emotions like uh, uh, surprise or uh, anger uh, you might find in, in cingulate. Um, fear, of course, has been classically associated with amygdala. So, yeah, there's some evidence of, of a differential within, within these systems, yeah. Okay. Um, there's a question here about lucid dreaming. Anybody want to have a crack at that? Terry, you, you know you can sleep, why, why, what on earth is going on, and how does that correlate with what we call consciousness? Well, there's a uh, type of dreaming uh, called lucid dreaming, or the hypnagogic state that occurs just as you're falling asleep. And in fact, you can uh, enhance this. Uh, some people can uh, bring this about, in which uh, you have certain conscious control, even though you are in a dreamlike state and you are things are happening the, the way that they are during REM sleep, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit uh, like uh, being uh, a player in, 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 and observing yourself. Uh, th there's, uh, this is a state that probably happens uh, <clears throat> on the wave between uh, the awake state and slow wave sleep at a time when uh, there are uh, very large-scale spindles occurring in, in the cortex that originate in the thalamus. And spindles are 10 to 14 hertz oscillations. They last for a few seconds. Uh, they're caused by low threshold calcium bursts of spikes originating in the thalamus and then engaging cortical circuitry through feedback loops. And it's the hallmark of this transition from wakefulness to sleep 
Nobody knows what spindles are for. They're a big mystery, but they continue to recur during the night, but they're especially prominent when you're falling asleep, and there may be some link between that and this lucid dreaming state, but it uh, hasn't been investigated. Can I add something there? Um, it, it may be true that some lucid dreams occur um, on sleep onset REM, but the majority of lucid dreams that have been studied in the lab do not occur at sleep onset. They occur in uh, normal REM. The, um, a lot of this work's been done by Steve Laberge um, in, uh, where is he? Um, at, uh, San Francisco. Um, and also by um, some other, um, Keith Hearn in Britain. Um, generally, they both agree uh, you can find out when people are in a lucid dream by, by signaling with the eyes. You know that your body's paralyzed during REM sleep, except for breathing and, and your eyes. So you can move your eyes. And really good lucid dreamers can not only become aware, the definition of a lucid dream is you become aware during the dream that it is a dream. So it's a bit like I was talking about earlier, am I conscious now? It's, am I dreaming now? Or I, wow, it's a dream, yay! Now, really good lucid dreamers can signal with their eyes like you know, 10 times back and forth to say, I'm dreaming now. You can then, you've got the electrodes on, you can say what stage of sleep. They're normally about three quarters of the way through a, a REM period late in the night, usually sort of five in the morning if you're having a normal sort of midnight to eight o'clock sleep, um, in, in, areas, in, in times of particularly high arousal during REM. My guess is that Have this... Have you ever had a lucid dream? Yeah, 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 quite a lot. Really? They're wonderful, fun. I can't, yeah. I can't induce them deliberately and I can't signal from them, but yes, I enjoy them. Um, so anyway, that, that'll do for, <laughs> so quite a bit is now, look, go, go to the Lucidity Institute um, of Steve Laberge's work if you want to find out more, and from there you could find, you could find out a lot more about those studies done. There was a, another question on sleep, which, which actually I, I, I think was a misunderstanding, but let, let me run, run it to you anyway, which was that uh, if, if, if Sarah's work showed that you can have the, take these naps and end up with better learning and the next day and so on, uh, it, is there anything in the patterns of people who have radically different sleep patterns, like the owls and the, and the larks and so on, that, that correlates with that? I mean, is it just easier for people who get up bright and early in the morning to, to learn new stuff, or what well, about unfortunately, we don't people who know, stay up late um, at night? We don't know. We can't ask the owls, you know, whether they've had any good ideas <laughs> when they wake up. But uh, owls are nocturnal, so the... the well, you know, no, 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 no. I was using it as a... Oh, oh, sorry, <laughs> night owls. <laughs> sorry. Yes. Uh, I misunderstood that. I, I, was, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was actually thinking about people like you who, when I come into the, into the lab, are still there at 3 so in the morning there, sending out emails. there's an enormous... Actually, going to your uh, point about individual variability, there's an enormous variability. There are some people who claim they don't have to sleep. Uh, if you actually track them, it turns out there are periods of inactivity when they sort of sit there and don't seem to be doing very much, but they claim they're not sleeping. Uh, and they, they probably don't have, uh, you know, they probably have very short episodes uh, that are not as dramatic. But uh, <clears throat> sleep, uh, there's, a, there's a very uh, clear uh, impact of sleep deprivation. Different people have different set points. Some people need more, some people need less. Some people have more REM, some less REM, and it's been very difficult to sort of correlate that with any differences in behavior. To, to, you know, to say that people who sleep more have better ideas. Um, but the one thing that does seem to be consistent is that uh, people who can use their sleep uh, by being very careful about what they read just before falling asleep. So if, if you, for example, are struggling with a mathematical problem and you've, you've been sort of working on it for hours and then, then you go to sleep, then you're more likely, it's kind of like having gotten your brain circuits activated, but now when you go to sleep, your brain will continue to work on it for some time and, and it's more likely in the morning that you'll come up with some answer to that particular question. So I know, I know friends who actually save their problems and, until you know, an hour before going to bed and then they work on it and they, they get their, their work done while they sleep. And if, if if we follow Richard McNally's uh, evidence, it's better not to read science fiction at night as well, as you might be, you might be abducted. Um, so Ursula, let me ask you a question. Um, you mentioned, you showed some um, slides, a uh, PowerPoint thing about, and mentioned France de Waal. Mm -hmm. um, as you probably know, there's been some recent experiments that France has published with his postdoc there, uh, in which the, they had capuchin monkeys that were trained to work for a reward and they could also see the other monkeys that were being tested at the same time. Normally, 
uh, the Capuchins were being given um, a piece of cucumber for a reward. Um, occasionally, one of them would be given a grape. The ones that were getting the piece of cucumber got really irritated when they saw the ones getting the grape <laughs> for the same piece of work. And they got really hissy uh, if they saw an animal being rewarded for not even having done the work. So uh, the suggestion there was that, that we have this um, capacity to compute um, fairness, should we call it, the beginnings of a moral sense, moral emotions. Um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a conflict here to some extent in that um, the kind of things that Terry talks about, John talks about, Paul talks about, we're talking about um, prediction, we're talking about reward circuitry. Uh, it sounds very mechanistic, but it's plainly at the root of these these things we think of just as, as human values. Um, and could, do you want to comment on that? It's a bit of a portmanteau question, but. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I, I see the question. I mean, I think that the whole thing of, you know, paying attention to where you are, I, I, I was calling it hierarchy, but I would say that the whole question of whether you're being dealt with fairly by the system uh, is encapsulated in my use of hierarchy and that, uh, Animals do notice stuff like that. They, they have expectations of where they are given their, where they see themselves. And if they don't get that, uh, the, uh, they will get irritated by it. But I think that, that I don't see well, wh where, are you, where are you going with your question. Okay. Um, in, in, in all of their talks, they're basically talking about systems that can be tested, mm -hmm. that obviously evolved, had utility. Um, Sue, for example, didn't like the idea of there being... Um, non-conscious states as opposed to conscious states, but underpinning all of this, uh, the, the things that Terry was talking about is, is this very um, uh, basic functional description of behavior. Right? You mean Terry or Franz? Terry. Deacon? No, 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 oh, sorry. Oh, Terry. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong Terry. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm sorry. Can I try that one, Terry? Yeah, try yeah. it. Do you have a mic? Uh, so you mentioned the, the ultimatum game, uh, this, this uh, task uh, economists use to look at uh, sharing. And a uh, recent paper showed that the same areas that are associated with visceral disgust are active in the brain when uh, people reject stingy or unfair offers in the ultimatum game. So I think what this means is that uh, since the brain is a conservative system, the same kinds of areas that are associated with uh, giving us guidance on how to get through the world, literally gut instinct, uh, are active when we are activating, potentially activating uh, moral sentiments. So I think, you know, we're, we're doing a much better job now of identifying um, uh, the sort of functional basis for the moral emotions. I could make John, a comment about John. that too. Um, not only is it in the uh, is, is anterior insula and, and frontal insular cortex are activated in the, uh, by the unfair offers, the perceived unfair offers in the ultimatum game in the sand phase experiment. And that same uh, region is activated in the experience of guilt and in the experience of, of trust uh, and also in deception um, and a couple of other things as well. It all basically involves sort of self-other relationships. But the, the, you could see... Um, a more basic function uh, to these to this area, basically anterior insular cortex, and that is that it clearly has a lot to do with with self awareness, with introspection, and both uh, Bud Craig, Bud, Bud Craig, for example, has, has shown that there is a, a, a more recently evolved pathway proceeding up actually from the spinal cord that maintains that, um, and also of course the Masio's ideas with respect to to the um, guidance uh, uh, in decision making is related to that. But so, or more broadly speaking, insular cortex is um, involved in the control of the ingestion of food, both the, the mecha mechanical act of swallowing and also <clears throat> the, 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 uh, the taste. So it, it it, when we speak of something as being disgusting, we can apply that to something which tastes bad, or we can reply it to something which is morally reprehensible. Um, so what I'm suggesting is, is that the circuitry that way back was involved in the accept, acceptance or rejection of food uh, became generalized 
into a domain of sort of pro-social and anti-social activities between, you know, where you have a love and hate and uh, resentment and acceptance, so the whole array of, of complex emotions, I think essentially use the same uh, neural substrate, uh, but it's been, been greatly elaborated in, in, uh, in, in, in us. Can I, can I make a, 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 just a general comment, not to beat a dead horse, but if you're looking at the behavior of organisms um, and you're looking at it functionally, which everyone here does, um, the function of the behavior occurs at two, at two levels, either phylogenetically, evolutionarily, in which case we talk about inherited behavior or fixed action patterns, or it occurs during the lifetime of the individual. Um, concentrating on the brain is, is certainly interesting and, and important, but you're concentrating on, on the proximate causes of the behavior. And I think we also need to know how the brain got to be constructed that way. And the answers to that, as I mentioned in my talk, are either looking in evolutionary biology to understand how brains evolved and to look at the individual history of, 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 of that individual, of the individual learning history. Um, it, just looking at the brain by itself is, will not give you all the answers. It will tell you how the brain got to be that way and how it's correlated with some behavior, but it does not answer the question of the function of the behavior. But just to make a point, no one advocates looking at the brain by itself. That would right. be silly. I mean, we're all very much involved in, in, in essentially behavioral paradigms as well. That's so, true, but, but the emphasis is certainly been... Not mine. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> not mine. No. So, you so, shouldn't speak for others. So you, I, I, uh, think, I think we've gotten past in, you know, scientific increase anyway of, you know, sort of throwing stones at people of being reductionist or uh, complexative people. I think that everybody understands that you have to reduce when you're trying to figure out and then you have to synthesize. And I think that um, most investigators now have that in mind and that we shouldn't be throwing stones at each other on that. Um, Hank, uh, somebody here, obviously, um, what is free will? An invention. An invention. Okay, the second one for you, um, which seems to reflect somebody who's been following Dan Dennis as well. Can I just add a, a little uh, footnote to that? Yeah. So, in fact, it was invented, I think, back in the Middle Ages or something, wasn't it? I mean, the, somebody else knows the history, but it, before that, people knew about will. I mean, will is something that is kind of an elemental property all metals have, but the idea that it was somehow free was, was something that just popped up in history. Well, I think, I think we make choices, but our choices are determined by our genes and our individual history. The fact that we're unaware of the causes of our behavior most of the time doesn't mean that our behavior is free or willed in that regard. I mean, I think that, you know, we talked about determinism and free will, and I agree with Sue, the two are incompatible. All scientists are determinists. I don't think we sit, we spin, we sit around spending a lot of time talking about determinism versus free will. As scientists, we just go about doing our science, assuming that the universe is orderly. Um, but as far as human behavior is concerned, we have the illusion that we have free will because we seem to behave without Im lots of immediate causes. That doesn't mean that our behavior isn't caused. And as determinists, I think we all have to assume that our behavior is caused. And the quest for scientists is discover, as uh, Sue pointed out, this, the quest for science is discover the causes. I'd like to add something there as well. That you can just stay as a scientist and say, okay, I'm not going to believe in free will, but then still live your life you know, so with you the have. illusion, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you, you can say, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to live as if free will, even though I don't believe in it. Um, or you can say, I'm not going to go on living this way. I'm going to drop it. I'm going to see through the illusion. That's what I've tried to do. And I'm sure there are others of you who have well, as well. And it can go away to the point when you just don't feel it anymore. And then, you know, <laughs> the world is quite different. Oh, I wonder what she's going to do next. Oh, how interesting. <laughs> So, 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 what does it feel like to have freed yourself from free will? <laughs> um, <laughs> liberating. <Ooh. laughs> yeah. So, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a seminar that we'll be looking at. There, there's something coming up at the, at the Sulk later in this year, which, in which uh, um, a number of California High Court judges come in, and they get tutorials from some of the scientists at Sulk and around the area on issues that come up in courts of law. So they'll be looking at things like addiction and, and, and memory and so on and so forth. There was a, there was a question here that was for uh, Rich McNally, but I think we can probably manage to deal with it. 
And it, it's looking at the sort of intersection of jurisprudence and the scientific information that goes into making decisions in courts. One, one aspect of this is if, if memory can't be trusted, even if intensely experienced, then what basis can eyewitness testimony be accepted in a court of law? Um, and there's, there's a whole bunch of other connections, uh, things that go along with that in the sense that um, if, if, if we know, what we know about prediction and reward mechanisms underpins what we think addiction is, then uh, there's a lot of people in, um, in, in, in jail who, who, have, who have, in one sense, in a biological sense, simply been um, experiencing prediction and reward circuitry has gone slightly awry. I mean, there's, there's you know, the, my genes made me do it kind of argument. Do you want anyone to sort of have a go at that? I think Elizabeth Loftus and her colleagues have more than answered the question about the reliability of eyewitness testimony. That's all I have to say. So what would you do then with, with, with eyewitness testimony? Be very afraid of it. Well, I think what you want is consistency. I mean, you, you want five people to have the <coughs> same view. You want to have uh, other kinds of evidence, convergent evidence. And, and that's certainly the neuroscience. There's nothing's proved until you have five or six or seven different groups finding six things, the same thing six different ways. And I think the same is true uh, in law. And I think what's interesting is that the science is having an impact on law uh, um, in ways that Hank suggested. So uh, that's important, you know, as, as we learn more as, as individuals, we learn more as a society as well. But it's rather difficult, I mean, to push this to the ultimate, if you actually do insist that it's a deterministic universe and there is no free will, um, these kinds of social constructs that we've made are, have no grounding in philosophy. And the, the argument that the genes made me do it is even worse when you start saying the memes made me do it. But in a way, it, that helps because you have to go to the limits of what you're talking about. And I think what happens then is that certain parts of law just have to disappear. You know, you don't punish people because deep down they're a bad person. Um, what, you ha what, what you can retain is that people learn and therefore you, uh, you have to apply rewards and punishments, that, that the, you have fairness in society that, that people want to be supported, so you have to treat people fairly, and also you have some people you have to lock up because they're a danger to society. All that stays anyway, and I think we're going to have to work out a legal system in which those things are maintained, and some of these silly arguments are put where they belong. Um, somebody has a card here that suggests sp sp sprinkling oxytocin on the food. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. But somebody, somebody else asked if, it's, if you think it's going to be the next love potion, <laughs> um, which it really, I suppose it already is. Uh, sure, naturally it, it is. I mean, the, the best way to spike your oxytocin, again, absent giving birth or breastfeeding, is to have sex. So uh, um, the way you feel after sex is uh, driven largely by oxytocin. Feeding will also do it. So as we eat, we will do that, which is, I think, why we have many of our meetings over food. Uh, and uh, I hope we'll have some nice uh, social intercourse over our meal as well. Yeah. And, I, and, I, 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 and I do have uh, some oxytocin in my pocket that I'll sp sprinkle on everyone's food as I go out. You must keep on using that I word, don't you? <laughs> um, does anybody want to comment on w uh, the relevance of... Actually, I have a question. Uh, does it really survive the digestive tract? No, it doesn't. Okay. No, okay. Right. 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 Uh, IV, IM, or IM, so... <laughs> No, it doesn't, unfortunately. In fact, that's one of the problems. Although uh, it, um, uh, uh, we should say, w when men are given this, uh, a, a, a significant proportion will uh, become sexually aroused. So it's a pretty happy hormone. But, yeah. Aren't there studies showing that it's elevated in people who are in love? Or I've heard about that, but I haven't read them. Uh, no, episodically. It's just okay. up and down. Up and down. Right. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's late. <laughs> it's pulsatile is what I meant to say. People, please. Anybody want to comment on the relevance of um, anything that Freud said? <laughs> getting silly. <laughs> no, no, it's one of the questions, it's one of the oh, cards. Really? Oh, I mean, the, you know, the, you have been talking about the conscious so and the unconscious. What did Freud say? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it was important that he said that a lot of our mental life is unconscious. I, yes. I mean, I think that's a huge, that's a huge uh, contribution and, and uh, you know, I, I think we're still there. 
I don't, because I think he took... I mean, all that had been said about the unconscious by Myers and William James and all sorts of people before that, and Helmholtz, I mean, lots of people had, had done experimental studies of it and, and uh, were really getting somewhere. And then he comes along and, 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 and puts this whole sexual orientation on it and this kind of active unconscious, which doesn't turn out to fit very well with experimental results we've had since. Right. I just think he diverted the, 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 the fledgling idea of the unconscious into a most unfortunate direction. Would, would anybody like to comment on that, that what a statement I made earlier, which was the sort of talking about a, a, um, a coming together of Eastern and Western positions that uh, scientists are putting meditators in, FR, in FMR machine, fMRI machines and so on and so forth. Um, do you have any, have any sense that that would lead to something important? Or is it on the level of what the bleep? I think these professional meditators that have been put in the machines, clearly, you know, the uh, data of Richie, Richie Davidson and stuff, they do have different um, properties um, that make sense. I mean, people who play the piano have different... Um, brain signals as well, and they should. They, they work for decades to ha develop these capacities. So yeah, it's just that you, both you and Sue used the, used the word mindfulness quite oh, okay. mindfully. Well, yeah. And yeah. To, to most people, that means something that Thich Nhat Hanh would make you say, or that the, the Buddha would say, or John Kabat-Zinn would say. I mean, th these are obviously concepts that are not mainstream science yet. Um, I think there are two different things going on here in the convergence between science and Buddhism. One is, as you've described, scientific studies of what's happening in meditation. And that is, at the moment, a big mess without real theoretical direction. So what I hope of that is that we'll get out of it some theories. It's quite clear that long-term meditators are able to do things with their brains that normal people can't, um, to do with training attention predominantly um, in different ways, in different um, traditions. Uh, but that... I don't know where that'll go, um, but I hope it'll go somewhere. The other is um, the coming together on a theoretical level of things like um, the concept of, of no self in Buddhism um, with the sort of ideas we've been talking about today to do with there not being a, a kind of thing called a self that's in there or a thing called consciousness. Um, some of the ideas about contingent um, dependent origination in Buddhism, which are kind of basic scientific ideas that everything has, has a prior cause and everything goes on to cause things. Um, so there's some coming together there theoretically, but these two things are really quite separate. I, I'm, I'm optimistic that all, this will be a very fruitful um, kind of um, uh, companionship between these, these two um, different disciplines, but they're pretty far apart at the moment. Okay. It's actually 7 o'clock. I'm sure you're all getting signals from your systems <laughs> that uh, you need to sate them in some fashion or other. So thank you for your patience. Thank the panel, please. And one last word from Sherma. No? No. Okay. Dinner is served. Bon appetit.